unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Proverbs 19 verses 3. The Bible says in Proverbs 19 verses 3, The foolishness of a man subverts his way and ruins, the Amplified says, his affairs. The foolishness of a man subverts his way and ruins his affairs then his heart the bible says is resentful and frets against the lord his heart is resentful and frets against the lord and unfortunately even though it's not right and fair but we have many people who have issues with god you know and they have issues with god because they think in their little finite understanding they can debate and question the porter, their porter, their creator, the God of infinite wisdom, potential and ability. And it's interesting to even imagine, it's like a little child who is, say, two years or three years old, you know, debating with a 60 or 50 year old. You know, it's interesting when you see how little kids bring out their affairs. But yet this is not even to be compared to the carnal man and God. And I've seen people in the world do that. Unfortunately also, I've seen Christians who do that, you know. One time I was counseling somebody and the person told me, oh, you know, I think I'm giving up on God. Everything I'm asking for, he's not given me. Everything I've believed him for, Choka, I've done this and done that. And all of the things that I've done, isn't God watching? Isn't God aware? Isn't he awakened to the fact that I'm doing all of this? And also, my sister, who's actually doing nothing, who's not born again, who didn't even care. But everything of hers is flourishing. Everything of hers is just going upward and upward. And for me, every little thing that I had, even the little successes that I have, they whittle every day. They go down and reduce to nothing. I think I'm frustrated. I'm giving up on God. Why would he do this? Why did he do that? And you hear that and you see that their language starts to change from simply questioning what's really happening to the place where they start to resent and fret against the Lord. If God loves me, why didn't he keep my father from death? I'll never pray again. Why didn't he preserve my mother from dying? I'll never worship that God again. Why didn't he keep my child? Didn't he see the pain my child went through? I took months and days praying for my child, and my child was not healed. I think I'm done with this God. I don't have nothing to do with that God. What's the point of dealing with that God? You see, the Bible says in Proverbs 19 verses 3, and I'm glad that I'm going to begin from there to define the power of wisdom. He says the foolishness of a man subverts his way, and that man ruins his affairs. All right? And then your heart, instead of seeking to understand why this issue is happening, why you fail to get results, why you fail to get success, you know, they turn to God and resent him. Somebody one time sent me a message and said, hey, Apostle, I've prayed, I've done everything. Why is it that my finances are not working? And ask them, oh, do you give your fast routes? You know, do you give your tights and all these things? And he says, sometimes. And I'm like, oh, wait, you've done everything? I said, wait, wait, say it again. Did you say you've done everything? I say, yeah, so then how about these things you do once in a while when comfort fits, you know? You doing things once in a while, and then after that you are asking me why things are not working because you think that by prayer only you fix your financial life? I told them, no, finances are not fixed by prayer. <laughs> finances are fixed by the principle of seed and harvest. Simple, you know. What you plant is what you reap, you know. Yes, we proclaim words in the atmosphere, I'm rich, I'm all that, but even if you speak as much as you want and you don't appropriate the principles of a man who believes that you are blessed of God, you'll never have the results of the blessing. And so it happens. Some people even go beyond that and even start to resent God. I learned this very early, very, very early, that if it doesn't work, 
There is something I'm missing. I have learned that and I've shared that with some of you who have worked with me for quite a number of years. I always tell people, if there's something that has not worked, I always know there's something that I have missed out. And in prayer and brokenness, I've always gone before God and asked, what have I missed? I might not be able to reverse what has already happened, but I can surely know how to sustain myself in future in case such a thing happens. We're learning. We're all learning process, okay? And every time I've sought God on something, it could take a week, could take months, could take years, but he always gives me the answer and tells me this is where you had gone wrong. This is how you had misunderstood. This is why this happened this way, because this and that were not connected that way. And when I get that answer, it always tells me, oh, I'm actually this work in progress that God is dealing every day to align, even as I'm aligned by God, by his will and purposes. My carnal man is submitting himself every day to the man of the spirit, that this perfection that I have in Christ also manifests without in my life that I might see it. But that wisdom, the simplest wisdom, that is why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is the beginning of wisdom. You find, you understand it and know the Bible says that even though Job went through all the sufferings that he went through, but the Bible says he did not judge God foolishly. He judged not God foolishly, okay? Regardless of what you go through, never judge God foolishly. Never judge God foolishly. Do not be quick to conclude, oh God is this, oh God is that. Don't be so quick. When you wait on him, you'll be amazed at the things you'll see and the bigger picture. It's later through scripture to realize that actually Job had broken a hedge of his life earlier. But there are people who can go on and start cursing God. He's sick and his wife even prompts him and tells him, go curse God and die. You see, because she did not know herself what was actually happening to her husband. And I bet you, any person would feel the pain she had when you've buried your children and you're seeing your husband lopping in pain every night, you know. And that's why I don't judge his wife, because I was not there. I don't know what she saw. You know, I don't know whether Job got to a point where his sickness was so bad that he would rather die. You know, it was one way of relieving the pain that he was going through. So regardless, again, we don't judge God foolishly. We're not quick to judge. And I've seen that many times it's because we have failed to understand and connect to wisdom. Okay, in Proverbs chapter 2. Verses 2, the message version, the Bible calls it the world of wisdom. Tune your ears to the world of wisdom. Set your heart on a life of understanding. It's a world. Wisdom is a world. Wisdom is like an eon. It's like a fixed period in the spirit, all right, that every believer is supposed to be attuned to. It's a world. You know, like foolishness is a world. Because the difference between the foolishness and this wisdom is simple. It's the vision. Not everything we see is. When Jesus Christ lays hands on the blind man, and that man's eyes open. He says, what do you see? He says, I see men as trees. Firstly, blind man, you have never seen men. All right? But you have an idea, a concept of what men would be. All right? But still, when you have a concept of what men would be, why would the blind man say, I see them as trees? Had he seen trees before? What did he mean by that? Okay? Did he have an idea, a concept in his mind touching what trees were, what people were, did he have a concept of what a tree was, did he touch one or two and then see them tall, you understand? And then Jesus, the Bible says, lays hands on him again. And the Bible says his eyesight was restored and he saw every man clearly, all right? Sometimes we are where we are because of what we see. And uh, the things that we have even in this life of Christianity could excite us, but there's a place where we go beyond excitement and actually ask ourselves the question, are our visions aligned to the true vision of God concerning the things we must see as we must see them? Because even the misunderstandings that we see between individuals is because two people see two different visions, die visions. They see two different things about the same thing, okay? And so when we talk about the world of wisdom, there is something that aligns the compass of our vision to see the true north, to see the things the way they're supposed to be seen. You have been in places where somebody makes a statement and you're like, then this person actually know or see that the word he has said or the statement he's made is actually not wise. It's because to you it is open in the world that you're functioning in wisdom to tell. But to them it's not given. They don't understand it. They cannot get it. 
And some people do not just simply offend lightly. They offend things that could change destinies and destroy lives, you know, because of judgment. Look at Hitler. Hitler killed more than 6 million Jews. I had an opportunity to go to Israel and I visited the Holocaust Museum. I had an opportunity to walk through the Holocaust Museum and I relieved the tales and I heard the stories and I saw uh, the places where they used to collect the clothes of the people that were killed, the shoes of the people that were killed, the shoes of the women and young children and men. Oh, it's so painful. You go through that and see what one man's mind did to millions of people and in his own head he thought that that was wisdom but the darkness in his heart that destroyed millions of people it's a place when you see the holocaust museum when you visit it it's something that only someone who has been there would tell the memories start to come alive the videos you see you understand they would get these jews and then they get them in groups and then take them and then tell them, you know, undress yourself and then they undress them and then leave the clothes out and then they take them in and then they put them in a gas chamber and release it and they kill all of them and then they use fellow Jews to get these bodies out and then they use those Jews to dig graves for their own and then they bury them and after burying them they kill them. It was so ugly. But in his own understanding, Hitler thought that that was wisdom. In his head, he was trying to relieve the world of the Jew because he thought that the Jew was the problem. He thought that the Jewish blood was the problem. Now, it's you and I who judge those matters and think for a moment, huh. there's a world leader, a president of one of those Muslim countries, and stood before television and said, the Holocaust did not take place. It was a lie of history. Somebody stood before national television and said that. It's how they see the world. You can never change them. It's the world in which they see. Okay? So there are people who take for wisdom. What actually is not wisdom? For somebody to actually carry the true wisdom of God in truth as it ought to be carried, it takes a special grace of God. It takes a certain place in God to understand this. Even in the faith, the man of Ecclesiastes speaks of the sorrow of wisdom. Why does he speak of the sorrow of wisdom? Because your eyes are open to the things some people are to obviously see, but they would not see. And then sometimes sorrow grips you because you see certain things that are supposed to be obvious, but to some people they're not obvious because it's the world in which they see things. It's the realm in which they see things. And the Christian faith, which you and I, are all and believe is supposed to know it's supposed to understand wisdom in its entirety in its perfection as it is the wisdom of god sophia right the wisdom of god we're supposed to know how that works because the opposite of that is foolishness all right now if you get to the world for example the bible says that the gospel is foolishness to them that are perishing what we you and i the believer is calling wisdom actually people in the world call foolishness Therefore, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved by it, the Bible says it is the power of God. But there are people, if we present Jesus Christ to them right now, we are foolish. We are foolish. And some of us, before we are born again, born again Christians look foolish. We will come to the world now, you look foolish as well to them that watch us. All right? But then sometimes when we look at an atheist, the person who does not believe that God exists, you ask yourself, how or why? All right? And so even to put this to the table, when you hear people say, oh, if God is so good, why are people dying? Eh? So he said, of corona across the world. Why are hundreds dying of corona across the world? Sometimes when you get in the heart of that person, it's not so much on what they have seen at the hour to judge God against what is happening, but rather their preconceived idea about God even before the event happened. But some Christians labor to explain to such people from the question they've asked, but not from the heart that has asked to understand, where is this person coming from? When somebody asks that kind of question, if God is good, why are people dying across the world? And doesn't he see the innocent? Doesn't he see that kid was born with HIV and they're dying? Sometimes it's the place 
of that person's heart and their opinion of God even before the event happened. People have a very wrong understanding about God and about the judgments of God. Many people can't separate what the devil is doing and what God is doing. There are many things that Satan has done and many people think actually God has done. Why well, isn't he able to help it? Why doesn't he stretch his hand and do that? Because they don't get it. They don't understand the judgments of God. They don't understand the heart of God. They cannot explain history beyond two, three, four, five years. I know a British man who lived in the time of Amin, the Amin's regime. And so they were somewhere in Jinja and then people came. He was a Christian. He was a Midist people. When they were non-believers. But anyway, there was an attack on them. For some reason, I did not get the explanation. And they shot everyone around him except him. All right. And that day, that man denounced God. Why? Why were innocent people killed in his presence? Right. But as a Christian, he never asked himself, why was his life preserved? Of course. Dear to God is the death of his beloved. God does not want to see death in the world. But there are things that are way bigger than many people are able to understand. And sometimes it's the Christian who thinks they've understood, but yet they've actually not understood. Sometimes the fruit of that, it's emitted through us. The way we react to certain things already shows. And sometimes it's not... What has this person done? What have I done as a believer that is out of the will and purposes of God's wisdom? But sometimes there are people who do things and sometimes you almost ask yourself that it's beyond what they have done, but are they really able to help it not to do? Because it's another thing when you're trying to help somebody who might never turn, who might never see the things the way they're supposed to see, all right? Now, when we are talking about godly wisdom in Proverbs 3, verse 15, the Bible says that skillful, the Amplified says skillful and godly wisdom, he says, is more precious than rubies. And nothing you can wish for is to be compared to her. Here, wisdom takes a feminine identity. All right? Now, I want to begin from there. When the Bible says that there is nothing you will ever wish for, you can compare to wisdom. How many times do we ask? How many times do we seek? How many times do we spend? And are we spent for wisdom if indeed she's above anything that we'd ever wish for? Unless we have not yet understood the price of wisdom. In fact, at one point in Proverbs, there's a point where he says that when you get a foolish man, to buy wisdom, it is useless because it is nothing to his heart. A foolish man cannot invest in wisdom because it is nothing to his heart. When the Bible says that skill of wisdom is more precious than rubies, it's more precious than the wealth that you wake up every morning to seek. Those of you who wake up every day and go to work, when you wake up in the morning and put on your clothes and drive to work and you know earn a living and buy a house and drive a car and take your children to school and you know prosperity comes your way and God tells you that godly and skillful wisdom is more precious than anything rubies it's more precious than anything you can wish for anything you could ever wish for take your wildest best cars best houses take your wildest even the most craziest wish you could ever have God has said but when I see my wisdom, I see that it is above anything that a man could ever wish for. So I ask, if wisdom is above anything that a man could ever wish for, how come we don't seek and align and connect to it like it is better than anything we could ever wish for? If a student gets books and has to study, all right, because they wish to graduate and have themselves a living, then what about the wisdom of God? Here we're not talking about worldly wisdom. We're talking about godly wisdom, skillful and godly wisdom. Why aren't you paying the price of seeking wisdom? How do you wake up in the morning and go to bed without aligning yourself to the thing God has said will never be compared to anything you could ever wish for? Why aren't men waking up with a word why aren't they going to bed at night with a word why aren't they relating with god's wisdom you know during their lunch times so there are people who are watching me right now you're a born again believer but if we ask you the last time you actually ever opened the bible on your own all right on your own that is why we preach the gospel every day 
for the past five years, every day of my life, a devotional has gone out on a man's phone, on a man's laptop, on a man's email, on a man's Facebook, on a man's WhatsApp. Something has gone out every day from our ministry as believers just to help you know. Because he said, this is the one thing you would desire more than anything you could ever need. How do you wake up in the morning and respond to a funny video, respond to a funny statement that your friend has said, and then do all that, and then skip a devotional, and you have it in your phone? How do you even wake up and everything else catches your attention except this one thing God said cannot be compared to anything you could ever wish for? How does that happen? It is because we have not yet understood what wisdom is. To our hearts, it's not yet a revelation. It's not yet a revelation. It's not yet a revelation. When David is teaching or speaking and instructing his son, remember, King David, the Bible calls David a man after the heart of God. A man after the heart of God. He was a man after the heart of God. From the Hebrew, it's a man with the heart of God. He meets a woman called Bathsheba. All right? In fact, the name Bathsheba is translated as a daughter of oath. And so it's no coincidence spiritually that the king makes an oath to Bathsheba and tells her that the child that shall come out of thy womb shall be king after me. So he commits himself to this. So as he sees Solomon out of Bathsheba, David knows that this is the boy that is going to take over his heart, his ministry. He's going to take over the office of kingship that has been ordained by God. He knows it, that Solomon is no average boy. He's going to change the world. He's going to continue his legacy. He looks at him as the one that shall preserve the next generation. But I want you to see what was in the heart of David. All right? And scripture now tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 3, if you read from the Amplified, he said, when I, Solomon, this is Solomon speaking, was a son with my father David, he says, tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, Bathsheba. He says, he taught me and he said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments, he said, and leave. And the next verse says, get skillful. This is a man after God's own heart, teaching the next king. This is a king instructing the king. He says, get skillful and godly wisdom. And he told him, get understanding, discernment, comprehension, and interpretation. Discernment, comprehension, and interpretation. That's understanding. And do not forget and turn back from the words of my mouth. And the next verse says, forsake not wisdom, he said, and she will keep you. She will keep you. Forsake not wisdom, and she will defend you and protect you. Love her, and she will guard you. This is a man after God's own heart. This is a man with the heart of God. He's revealing the heart of God of any king to a king. These are things that only kings understand. I saw a young man waste himself in alcohol. He was a Christian young man. And this young man said, Oh, you know why I drink? It's not written anywhere in scripture that it is wrong to drink alcohol, the young man said. Okay, even Jesus turned water into wine. But when the mother of Lemuel is speaking to her son, the king in Proverbs 31, she tells Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. She tells him, it's not for kings. It's not for kings. It's not for kings. Or, wait, so if the Bible says in Revelations that you have been made kings and priests to the Most High God, He has made us and to our God kings and priests, as Revelation 5.10, and we shall reign on earth. If you are saying that you're living and walking in the kingly anointing, all right, and the Bible tells you in Proverbs 31 that it is not for kings to take wine, nor for princes to take cold drink, what is God's wisdom telling you? He's not saying that it's wrong, but he's saying when you are elevated in the kingly anointing, wine is not for you. You cannot function in the kingly anointing as well compromise yourself with something that you know is contrary to what the king has to have. Because the fifth verse said, when he says it's not for kings to take wine, he says, list 
they drink and forget the law and pervert judgment, the judgment of the afflicted. Because he knows once wine comes in a kingly anointing, the man will forget the law, the word. He will disconnect from revelation. And that revelation, that word, the law of God, is supposed to keep the man. Remember when David is telling Solomon, he says, attend to wisdom and she will keep you. She will defend you. She will protect you. She will guard you. It's her ministry to guard you. So when he says in Proverbs 31 that it's not for king to take wine, then he says, at least they drink and forget the law and forget that which is to preserve them and forget that which is supposed to guard them and forget that which is supposed to defend them. It means that in that anointing and glory, you could do something so stupid that could destroy you that could destroy your next two, three, or ten years because of that. Is that worth it? No, it's not worth it. He tells Lemuel, if you are to give wine, he says, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that are heavy-hearted. He said, it's allowed if a man is heavy-hearted or if a man is ready to perish. Are you ready to perish? Are you heavy-hearted? He said, okay, give wine to that one. Now, for a new creation believer, at what point do you get heavy-hearted? And what has God taught about our heavy-heartedness? What has God taught when you wake up and you're heavy-hearted? Do you turn to wine? That is for carnal men. If you find a man who is given into wine, there are two things about him. Either that man has a heavy heart or that man hates himself and he wants to die. He has a suicidal spirit with him. He's scared of the world that he sees and he has no business with the world that is present now. But I just began with the issue called wine. But we have believers who say, but it's not written anywhere that someone should not get wine. It takes a certain wisdom to know that wine is not for kings. It's not for kings. But it takes a certain grace for somebody to see that in scripture. Because somebody who's saying it's not anywhere in scripture that someone should not take wine. There's people who argue over that have struggled in nations where you go for ministry and after ministry guys drink and they're out and they start doing things that are unbelievable. And these were people that were saying in the church, I've seen it with my eyes. And I'm not judging them, understand me, I'm not judging where they are at. But if they knew who they were, if they knew who they were, they would know they were better without it. They would know that they don't need it. They have something that can get you higher than wine could ever be. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine where any is excess. It says, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. All right? There's something the Holy Spirit does. There's something it does to the heart that is heavy. There's something it does to the man that is perishing. It's that moment when you are alone in your house and he comes in and fills and saturates you your whole being and oh god and he messes everything out you know right side up and a man needs to get to that place no man who has experienced that level a certain level of the presence of god will ever desire any consolation from wine they will never desire it right so he tells him love wisdom and she will guard you love wisdom and she will protect you love wisdom and she will keep you. Love wisdom. He says, and she will defend you from disease. She will defend you and keep you from poverty. She will defend and keep you from lack. The wisdom of God will get you out of that state of feeling stuck and confused. That's the wisdom of God. He says, this is what he will do. And he continues to tell his son in verse 7. He says, the beginning of wisdom is, this is where you begin from. Get wisdom, skillful and godly wisdom, for skillful and godly wisdom is the principal thing and i'll explain why it's principal and with all you have gotten he tells him get understanding discernment comprehension and interpretation verse 8 he says prize wisdom highly and exalt her and the bible says she will exalt and promote you you wake up every day and attach yourself to the wisdom of god she will promote you there's a certain version that says wisdom will make you great and she will bring you honor when you embrace her i'm talking about people who demand honor oh you know you honor honor me oh, no 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 i'm talking about the wisdom of god that causes men to honor you before you even ask it before you demand it without you know pushing for it but they see it. they see it on your life they see it on your life. Because without that, you're going to force men to honor you. There are men and women of God across the world who are honored. Because people see what's upon their lives. You might never understand it, but people do. 
right? But there are also those who impose it. You have to honor me. You have to do this. That's who they are. You understand? The Bible says give honor. Rather than say demand honor. The Bible says give honor to whom honor is due. And it also goes into honorariums. I've seen preachers who say, I'm not going to come to your church until you give me this honorarium. No, you are not the demander of honor. No, people are the giver of honor. If I'm invited in any nation, in any country, in any church, and they tell me, hey, we want you to come and preach it, whether it's in the U.S. or in Europe, and they ask me, how much honorarium do you want? I usually tell them, no, you give me according to what you feel the Lord has laid on your heart. And I tell them, and I shall not complain if you don't give me a penny. Why? Because I know what's in me. I know what is in me, but this has become a very, very filthy and lucrative dealing, more so in the most developed nations have been that some people, if you don't deposit this amount of money in their accounts, they cannot come to your meeting. Yet what they are selling was freely given. What they're saying was freely given. That's corrupt. And they can justify it. But that's corrupt. Honor is given. It's not demanded. Honorariums are given, but they're not demanded. Or oh, so what if they'll give you less because you didn't demand what you feel is right for you? They're not your boss. They're not your employer. The Bible doesn't say that you reap where you sow. The Bible says you reap what you sow. I've heard people, oh, if you don't give me this money, I'm not coming. If you give me this much, I'll leave my Sunday church, and then I'll come and preach for you. Do you know what that takes as a pastor if you should get somebody like that on your altar? who is already compromised with the order of God, that kind of gift is not worth for certain altars, not for Nero, and most certainly for some churches out there. Because there's been just fight for nothing. I think it's somewhere in Micah 3.11 where he says, the heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for a hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. How can a prophet tell you to prophesy on your life, give me this? To meet the prophet, you have to pay this. That is foolish. That is foolish. That's not the wisdom of God. How much was paid to meet Elijah? How much was paid to meet Elisha? You understand what I'm saying? You can tell it to your heart that I'm not going to go before the man of God without a seed. But that should be from your heart because the Bible says in the giving, the heart must be made up. But how many people even have a price and say, you know, to see our man of God, you have to pay this much of money. So if I have to pay a particular amount of money, at what point then is my heart purpose? Like 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, it says, for every man according as he has purpose, let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. It's not needed of you, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Why are men still charging people to see them in counseling? That's not the wisdom of God. That's darkness. Right? So in Micah 3, 8, he speaks of how the heads thereof judge for a reward. But if you read in the earlier verses, you realize he was talking about the corruption that had befallen the people of God. Corruption that had befallen Jerusalem. The spirit of corruption. The corrupt spirit. So we're not talking about our governments being corrupt. Churches, what are we doing? Men of God, what are we doing? We say, oh, the government is corrupt. Corruption. No, 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 no. What? are we the churches doing because these people who are corrupt in the world come to our churches for service and we emit corrupt spirits to them because our altars are already corrupted with filthy lucre with a love of money so how can a man not rob his office his government office when the guy who is teaching him is also playing the same games no man of god should put a price on the gospel that is why paul says it in scripture and he says, and I made the gospel of no charge. He says, least I lose my power in the gospel. This is Paul. He says, I made the gospel of no charge. Least I lose my power in the gospel. This is divine wisdom. This is divine wisdom. Yes, I should not muzzle the ox that treads out the hay. I know that scripture. But it's my responsibility not to muzzle the ox. It's not the responsibility of the ox to ask for the hay. Hello? It's not that. Every man of God, your portion is Christ. Your inheritance is Jesus Christ. How can a Christian know this and still go to a person who says, to see me, you have to pay that much? Hello? Hello? Wisdom. So, he tells his son, she will guard you, she will keep you. And he tells him, 
prize wisdom highly and exalt her, that's it, and she'll promote you, okay, and bring you to honor when you embrace her. That means if you know what you have, if I know the kind of message that I have, I will never ask for an honorarium. One time I went to preach somewhere and the man asked me how much should we give you and I told him, look, what is inside me you can't pay for? It's too expensive. So what should we do? I told him, you just do what you feel the Lord gave on your heart. But I would never lay a heart on a man to tell them I'm not going to come to your meeting because you didn't pay me. It's not my ministry. It's Christ's ministry. He has ways of paying his servants. All right? Wisdom promotes. Wisdom honors you, he said. Nine, he says, she shall give you your head a wreath of gracefulness. And wisdom will give you a crown of beauty. Wisdom is a beautifier. Wisdom is a beautifier. All those who have wisdom have a beauty on them. It's from their spirit. It comes from their spirit. It comes out. The Bible says, and glory she will deliver to you. Wisdom will give you a certain glory. How can you not wake up to this every morning and go to bed with it? From the time I understood these things, there's never been a day I've not read the Word of God. How? I've not applied myself to the Word of God. How? It's just not possible. How? Okay? And then he continues in verses 10. He says, Hear, O my son, and receive my saying, and the years of your life shall be many. I have taught you in the way of skillful and godly wisdom. He says, I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your steps shall not be hampered. Your path will be clear and open. And when you run, you shall not stumble. It makes you swift in the spirit. He knows the next king. This is a son speaking in two, not just two, but in two, the next king. No wonder when God appears to Solomon in a vision, that's exactly what he asks for, even in his sleep, because the seed was planted by a kingly anointing in his soul. He knew it. And that is why later, as he's speaking about this wisdom, he skips to verses 19, where he says, but the path of the just the uncompromisingly just and righteous is like the light of dawn and shines more and more brighter and clearer until it reaches its full strength and glory in the perfect day to be prepared. He says the path of the just shines brighter and brighter and brighter until a perfect day. But you see, to get to this path of the just, this just fellow is made just or is made righteous because of the wisdom that he has applied himself into. So when we say the path of the just shines bright and bright until a perfect day, the righteousness that is imputed upon you by faith has a precedence of wisdom. It's this wisdom that gives you that righteousness. And this is now the people that are shining. It's what makes you shine. All right? You shine brighter every day, every day. You are better than you were yesterday. Every month you're better than you were last month. Every year you're better than the years previous. And you're going upward and upward only. That is why it says in Proverbs 12 verse 8, A man shall be commended according to his wisdom. A man shall be commended according to his wisdom. The Bible says, But he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. Now the word therefore commended is halal, meaning shining figuratively of the favor of God. To shine because of the favor of God on your life. He says a man shall be commended because of his wisdom. A man shall shine with the favor of God if he applies himself to wisdom. Your wisdom, the wisdom that is in your spirit, is the thing that will make you shine with favor. When somebody says, Apostle, pray for me. I have a spirit of rejection. <laughs> You're not wise. <laughs> You're not wise. If you carry the wisdom which is of God, you would not carry any form of rejection. Men that carry wisdom cannot be rejected. No, because the favor of God is around you. People love you without even knowing why they love you. Some people would love you and do and give anything for you because you've connected them to wisdom. All right? But remember, like I said, this wisdom and the path of the just that is shining brighter and brighter cannot happen without the precedence of wisdom so Jesus Christ then comes to us and when Jesus comes in the flesh all right he comes as the wisdom of God the Bible says in him are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge in him so Christ comes with all this wisdom in him with all these treasures of wisdom in him and I love how first Corinthians says it in the chapter 1 verses 30 if you read the amplified and I'm going to show you 
how this brightness, this shining comes of the just. Because remember, it's this just person. It's this righteousness. It's this justification that enlightens you. It's this justification that lights your path and improves you every other day, promotes you and glorifies you every other day. And I say that cannot come except the wisdom of God precedes it. Now, in 1 Corinthians 1.30, in the Amplified, the Bible says, but it is from him, and him here they mean God, that you have your life in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. It is from him, that God, that you have your life in Christ Jesus. All right? Now listen to the Amplified. Whom God made our wisdom. He made our wisdom. So Jesus is your wisdom. It's Sophia. So, okay, so he said, but the Bible says in James that he that lacks wisdom. Let him ask to the God who gives liberally to whoever asks. So somebody says, so why would I ask for wisdom? Because the same word is Sophia. If I have Christ, who is my Sophia? No, in James, he's talking about the wisdom of application. Because to have a wisdom of a thing, I can have the wisdom of a thing through Christ. But to have the wisdom of application of that thing, it's another thing, okay? Because, for example, in Proverbs 2, when he's teaching about wisdom, and I'll give you a little sneak preview so those of you who want to study, he's telling his son, if you incline yourself and give your heart to this perfect wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, da 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 da, he goes down into the fourth and fifth verse and then he starts to feel, if you seek her as silver and such her as he treasures, he says that then you shall understand the fear of the Lord. You shall understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge. And remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah? In other words, there is a wisdom that leads to a certain wisdom, and that wisdom leads to a certain wisdom, and that wisdom leads to a certain wisdom. It has dimensions, about five dimensions of the wisdom of God. And to apply yourself, when we say it's a principal thing, Christ is the beginning of all that, and all these dimensions are found in that one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been made wisdom for God. And he says, revealed to us, this wisdom is revealed to us as knowledge of the divine plan of salvation, previously hidden. And the next line says, manifesting itself. It's manifesting itself as, the next verse, our righteousness. So it's this wisdom that manifests itself as our righteousness. Before you receive the righteousness which is imputed, to you in Christ. Wisdom precedes it. And that wisdom is Christ. Christ is that wisdom through whom we have carried the manifestation for justification, for our righteousness. Justification does not precede the wisdom. Wisdom precedes justification. And because God knew that you need wisdom for your justification, he brought that wisdom in the person of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then he continues to say that this wisdom is manifested itself or is manifesting itself as our righteousness, thus making us upright and putting us in right standing with God. And our consecration, you see, making us pure and holy and our redemption that is providing our ransom from the eternal penalty of sin. So you see, it began with wisdom, and wisdom gave you justification or righteousness through Christ, and that righteousness gave you consecration that made you pure and holy, and that wisdom again gives you redemption. So it was from wisdom that we got justification, justification, consecration, consecration, redemption. That's the power of wisdom. God in sundry times and in diverse ways spake unto the prophets, the Bible says in Hebrews. But he has in these last days spoken through his son Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed heir of all things and by whom he made also the eons, the world. When you receive Jesus, you carry the wisdom of God. When you study the gospel, when you read the word of God, which Christ is the word, it means you are acquainting yourself with the wisdom of God that is in you. You are acquainting yourself with what you have. You're helping your mind understand what is in your spirit. So how can you not invest in wisdom? How can you not invest in the wisdom of God? How can you not read the word? 
I see people hoping church to church, ministry, ministry, man of God to man of God, you know, demon chaser to demon chaser, apostle to apostle, this to that, they want a job, their marriages are failing, this is not working. It was all clear. It was all clear. It's like one story of a man I had in India, of a guy who was in a room with a guy who he knew was a thief, all right? And so this fellow had a lot of money, and he knew that in case he leaves that room, this fellow would steal his money. So what does he do, all right? He tells this guy who is a thief and sends him out of the room and tells him, you know, go freshen yourself and then return. And then this guy goes out, and when he does, this guy gets all his money and puts it under the pillow of the thief. All his money in the pillow of the thief. So when this guy goes out, this thief comes in and starts searching everything of the rich man. And he searches and searches and cannot find anything. Why can't he find anything? Because the rich man knows that this fool cannot know that the money is actually under his pillow. So when the rich man comes back, finds everything shaken, then turns to this guy and tells him, look, whatever you are looking for was just under your pillow. It was the best place I could hide because your brain could not tell you that I could hide this closest to you. Some things are so close. Your miracle is closer than you see it. Your healing is closer than you see it. Your breakthrough is closer than you see it. But some of you are searching in the wrong places. Wisdom is here. The wisdom of God is here. Embrace it. Connect to it. Align yourself to it. All right? You will shine. Ecclesiastes speaks of how wisdom makes the face of a man shine, the countenance of a man shine. Huh? When you get this wisdom in your spirit, it, it, it enlightens your spirit. There's something it puts on you, and anybody that connects the spirit realm can tell that there is something that is so different about you. Even before you speak, it has that aura, it has that impression. It has that favor in it. You enter an office and people look at you. Even before they know you, they just want to bless you. They want to do good to you. They want to provide for you. And they want to improve you because there's something on you that is improvable and can be and should be improved and promoted always. That is the power of the wisdom of God. And to know that all of this is in Christ and that you have him in the inside of you. Ho shatalabaya. Raise your voice and thank you. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the wisdom with which we have in Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you for the wisdom that we have in Christ. He was made our wisdom. And that manifests itself as our righteousness, our consecration, the purity and holiness that we have, our redemption that we have in him. All that is through this wisdom. Thank you for wisdom, God. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for wisdom coming in a person. And we saw what he did. He came to seek that which was lost. In Luke 19, he wept to the city and asked and said, Oh, how I wish you had known the things that would make for your peace. But because you know not them, the Bible says, wars are encompassing you. Troubles are around you. Sicknesses, death is around you. Because you do not know the things that are for your peace. The wisdom of God has been available for us that will be healed through this. And I decree and I declare that because by his stripes you are healed, I speak healing in your body and in your bones for every kind of sickness in the name of Jesus. Speak deliverance. May you have an answer for your house. May you have an answer in your marriage. May you have an answer with your child on drugs, with your children that are failing, with your daughter that has failed to settle in marriage, with your grandchild that is struggling with that disease. May God use you for the answer because it's available in Christ. May your eyes be open to all the dimensions of God's wisdom. May you understand them. May you connect fully because they're all revealed in this one man, Jesus Christ, and the application of the same, the interpretation of the same. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because you've availed this. And our life cannot be the same again. You're brighter than you were yesterday. This one hour of sitting with me in fellowship has brightened your countenance already. In Jesus' mighty name we prayed and believed. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. If you're there and you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity. This man is your wisdom. But more than just that, he gave his life. Wisdom gave his life and shed his blood at Calvary for the remission of your sins that you would be translated from darkness into his marvelous light while we all the saints are in who are born again. I want to give you that opportunity. Today is the best day. Now is the hour. God doesn't want you to first perfect yourself. No, come as you are, he'll receive you. Repeat this as after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I believe in my heart that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Today, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at Fenero at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.